Klimek was born in 1938 in Yugoslavia, but he's lived most of his life in this country. He teaches now at the University of New Hampshire, and he's published many books of poetry over the almost past 20 years. Uh, some of the more recent titles include Selected Poems, and most recently, Unending Blues. Both of those books we have for sale at the reception following reading, which I'd like to invite you to stay for. He's received many awards, including Guggenheim and MacArthur Fellowship. And uh, having been reading his poetry for almost 20 years now, but never having had an opportunity to hear him before, I'm very much looking forward to being here tonight and, and hearing him read his poetry for the first time. So I'd like to present to you Charles Sinnott. Thank you. <coughs> Um, I'm going to read um, um, a lot of new things uh, unpublished or to be published in magazines and uh, uh, some things that are older but not too old. Uh, this is falling apart. Uh, let me fix it up. Uh, I want to begin with a poem called Prodigy and it's a poem that um, Uh, it's autobiographical. Uh, it deals with my my childhood during the war in Yugoslavia, and um, it's one of the few poems that I wrote uh, uh, where I left things as they were. I mean, I did not at any point fictionalize anything. I didn't have to change anything. Usually, what happens? You begin to write about yourself or some experience that you had. But as you start putting the words on the page, uh, a kind of a fictional situation is created, which is so much more interesting than what happened to you, uh, that you sort of abandon the initial project and you go off and you, you, know, you spin a tale. You make a fiction. You lie to tell the truth. But uh, in this particular case, I did not have to uh, do anything like that. Uh, uh, it's one of those things you remember. I remembered it at some point, uh, and then as I remembered it, it all sort of seemed to fit into place. Uh, a poem is called Prodigy because this is an exaggerated, really, compliment to myself, belated compliment. I used to play chess quite well, and uh, not as good to be called really a prodigy, but you know, uh, anyway. Uh, I needed that title for the poem. Uh, also in the poem, uh, a Roman graveyard is mentioned, so which could be misleading. And this is not happening in Rome. It's happening in the Balkans, where there are indeed many ancient Roman graveyards. I mean, they're all over the place, you know. So anyway, this is a kind of a, well, I think there are dates here, so yeah, I don't have to tell you any more about the poem, Prodigy. I grew up bent over a chessboard. I loved the word endgame. All my cousins looked worried. It was a small house near a Roman graveyard. Planes and tanks shook its window panes. A retired professor of astronomy taught me how to play. That must have been in 1944. In the set we were using, the paint had almost chipped off the black pieces. The white king was missing and had to be substituted for. I'm told, but do not believe, that that summer I witnessed men hung from telephone poles. I remember my mother blindfolding me a lot. She had a way of tucking my head suddenly under her overcoat. In chess, too, the professor told me, the masters play blindfolded, the great ones on several boards at the same time. Uh, now, here is another kind of poem that is autobiographical. 
and uh, it's uh, of a different period. Uh, I wrote last winter a few poems about 1958, a period when I came from uh, Chicago to New York City. I moved from Chicago to New York City. Uh, I left Chicago for no reason that I can remember now. I just decided I, I had enough of Chicago, so I went to New York. And uh, so uh, I'll read you tonight a couple of these poems uh, from that period. I remember the period that I remembered myself. And uh, uh, it's a period that I really didn't think much about over the years. So coming back to it, I, I, I saw myself at a distance, like a character. I mean, I, I, it wasn't really me anymore. It was somebody very really funny who, a very strange, silly young man, you know, sort of walking these streets and doing these things. And, uh, so the poems kind of came out of that, out of that remembering. So uh, uh, this one is sort of uh, mentions, you know, being on a train from Chicago to New York City, leaving Chicago. And uh, all the poems in, in, in the series, not all of them, but uh, most of them, uh, have for a title a name of an author, I mean, a, a great writer, a philosopher, a poet, because I, I was remembering the books that I was reading at the time, and they were sort of the books that were important. And uh, so I'm thinking about the books and thinking about those days that all came together. Uh, so this one is called St. Thomas Aquinas. I left parts of myself everywhere the way absent-minded people leave gloves and umbrellas whose colors are somber and have the air of endless misfortune. I was on a park bench asleep. It was like the art of ancient Egypt. I didn't want to wake myself. I took the evening train with my heart's heaviness for luggage. We give death to a child when we give it a doll, said the woman who, who had read Juna Barnes. We whispered all night. She had been to Africa. She had many stories to tell about the jungle. I was already in New York City looking for work. It was raining as in the old black and white movies. I stood in many doorways in that city. Once I asked a well-dressed man for the time. He gave me a frightened look and walked out into the rain. Since man naturally desires happiness, according to St. Thomas Aquinas, who gave irrefutable proofs of God's existence and purpose, I loaded trucks in the garment center. Me and a black man stole a woman's red dress. It was of silk. It shimmered. Upon a gloomy night, with all our loving ardors and fire, we carried it down the long, empty avenue, each holding one sleeve. The heat was intolerable, causing many terrifying human faces to come out of hiding. In the public library reading room, there was a single fan barely turning. I had the travels of Herman Melville to serve me as a pillow. I was on a ghost ship with its full sails raised. I could see no land. The sea and its monsters could not fool me. I followed the saintly looking nurse down a dim hallway. We edged past people with eyes and ears bandaged. I'm a Chinese philosopher in exile, I told my landlady that night, and truly, I no longer look like myself. I wore glasses, one of which lens had a spider track. I stayed in the movies late into the night. A woman on the screen walked through a bomb city again and again. She wore army boots. Her legs were long and bare. It was cold wherever she was. Her face was averted, but I was in love with her. I expected to find wartime Europe at the exit. It wasn't even snowing. Everyone I met had a part of my destiny, worn like a mask. I'm Bartleby the Scrivener, I told the Italian waiter. Me too, he replied. <laughs> and I could see nothing but overflowing ashtrays, the human face flies were trying to cross.
This is something different now, a little bit different. Uh, well, it's a different place. Uh, it's a poem called Toward Nightfall. And uh, uh, where I live in New Hampshire, there used to be, they're kind of disappearing now, but there used to be quite a few of these old uh, semi-abandoned mill towns. Uh, Places that were, you know, they had textile and shoe factories, and they just all left. And uh, uh, I think we have some here too. Uh, uh, but um, uh, now all that's changing. Sort of, um, they're fixing up the old factories and um, you know, putting in boutiques, and the yuppies are moving in. And I don't know. It's it's, it's not, you know, they're hard to find anymore. You have to go to Maine, like Lewiston, Maine, or a little bit north to to really get a true taste of these places, but uh, uh, there's still one near where I live called Pittsfield, New Hampshire, and uh, it's a uh, uh, strange, grim, sad place. You really have a sense of the Industrial Revolution, you know, uh, what it was when you, when you go there, especially in, you know, in winter. Uh, so this poem, I guess about simply going there one day. And uh, it's called Toward Nightfall, and it's for uh, Donald Hall and Jane Kenyon, who live sort of not too far away. So we talked about this place, you know. Toward Nightfall. The weight of tragic events on everyone's back, just as tragedy in the proper Greek sense was thought impossible to compose in our day. There were scaffolds, makeshift stages, puny figures on them, like small indistinct animals caught in the headlights crossing the road way ahead. In the gray twilight, they went on hesitating on the verge of a huge starless autumn night. One could have been in the back of an open truck hunkering because of the speed and chill. One could have been walking with a sidelong glance at the many troubling shapes the bare trees made, like those about to shriek but finding themselves unable to utter a word now. One could have been in one of these dying mill towns inside a small dim grocery when the news broke. One would have drawn near the radio with the one many months pregnant who serves there at that hour. Was there a smell of spilled blood in the air, or was it that other much finer scent of fear, the fear of approaching death one met on the empty street? Monsters on movie posters, too, prominently displayed. Then six factory girls, arm in arm, laughing as if they'd been drinking. At the very least, one could have been one of them, the one with a mouth painted bright red who feels out of sorts for no reason, very pale. And so, excusing herself, vanishes where it says, rooms for rent, and immediately goes to bed, fully dressed, only to lie with eyes open, trembling despite the covers. It's just a bad chill, she keeps telling herself, not having seen the papers which the landlord has a dog bring from the front porch. The old man never learned to read well, and so reads on in that half whisper and in that half light verging on the dark about that day's tragedies, which supposedly are not tragedies, in the absence of figures endowed with classic nobility of soul. Uh, here's a poem called Evening Talk. And uh, I won't tell you anything about it. Everything you didn't understand made you what you are. 
strangers whose eyes you caught on the street studying you. It may be they were the all-seeing Illuminati. They knew what you didn't and left you as if after a strange dream. Not even the lights stay the same. Where did all that hard glare come from? And the smell, as if mythical beings were being groomed and fed stalks of hay on these roofs scattered among the evening clouds. You didn't understand the thing. You loved the crowds at the end of the day that brought you so many mysteries. There was always someone you were meant to meet who wasn't waiting, or perhaps they were, but not here. You should have crossed the street and followed that obviously demented woman with a long streak of blood-red hair which the sky took up like a distant cry. This, a uh, couple more city poems, and then we'll go someplace else. Uh, um, I love cities. I lived most of my life in the cities, and uh, um, now I live in the country. <laughs> and, uh, but I still need the cities like a drug. Uh, and uh, here's a poem. Oh, it's in the wrong book. Uh, called Midpoint. I, one summer, I, I don't even remember when it was, I, I started writing a poem about various cities that I loved. Uh, and it's kind of like a long, old, you know, all these cities, you know, great cities you know, that I lived in. And then I noticed, writing the poem, how what I liked about all the cities was one and the same thing. I mean, what you like, you know, in cities are, are similar things. So the poem was very really repetitive. Um, so uh, that wasn't all good, you know, I mean, you know, just saying the same thing over and over again. So. I realized that the whole thing could be reduced to a kind of equation. You know, there's a city A and a city B, you know, and I'm between city A and city B, moving between those two places. And, uh, and then I thought of those 19th century writers, especially Russian writers, who love to do that when they would not actually name the place, but they would just use the letter, you know, like Chekhov loves that. I to say, in, in N, there lived a widow, S, you know, who fell in love with book, bookkeeper, P, you know. You know, there's sort of supposedly real people behind that, you know, you know, you know thing. So anyway, that's, that's essentially the strategy here. Uh, from being, you know, something like 10 pages long, it got down to about a page, you know, which is just good enough, you know. Uh, so there's city A and B. Midpoint, it's called. No sooner had I left A than I started doubting its existence, its streets and noisy crowds, its famous all-night cafes and prisons. It was dinner time. The bakeries were closing, their shelves empty and white with flour. The grocers were lowering their iron grills. A lovely young woman was buying the last cassava melon. Even the back alley where I was born blurs, dims. Oh, rooftops, armadas of bedsheets and shirts in the blustery crimson dusk. B, at which I'm destined to arrive by and by, doesn't exist now. Hurriedly, they are building it for my arrival, and on that day, it will be ready. Its streets and noisy crowds, even the schoolhouse where I first forged my father's signature, knowing that on the day of my departure, it will vanish forever, just as A did. This is a poem about a poet, uh, a poet 
the great dramatic poet Shelley. It's a poem, but it's not so much that I, it's the first time that I read Shelley, uh, the day I'm describing here in this poem, but I, I suppose I realized that Shelley was a great poet. Uh, since that particular day, which was some 30 years ago, almost 30 years ago, I haven't been so sure, but uh, uh, this is 1958, so, you know, I, on this day, I thought this Mr. Shelley was tops. And uh, so the poem, Shelley. Poet of the dead leaves, driven like ghosts, driven like pestilence-stricken multitudes, I read you first one rainy evening in New York City. In my atrocious Slavic accent, saying the mellifluous verses, from a battered, much-stained volume I bought earlier that day in a used bookstore on 4th Avenue run by an initiate of the occult masters. The little money I had already spent, I walked the streets, my nose in the book. I sat in a dingy coffee shop with last summer's dead flies on the table. The owner was an ex-sailor who had grown a huge hump on his back watching the empty street, the rain. He was glad to have me sit and read. He'd refill my cup with a liquid dark as river sticks. Shelley spoke of a mad, blind, dying king, rulers who neither see nor feel nor know, of graves from which a glorious phantom may burst to illumine our tempestuous day. I too felt like a glorious phantom, going to have my dinner in a Chinese restaurant I knew so well. He had a three-fingered waiter who would bring my soup and rice each night without uttering a word. I never saw anyone else. The kitchen was separated by a curtain of glass beads which clicked faintly if the front door opened. The front door opened that evening to admit a pale little girl with glasses. The poet spoke of the everlasting universe of things, of gleams of a remoter world which visit the soul in sleep, of a desert peopled by storms alone. The streets were full of broken umbrellas which looked like funereal kites the little Chinese girl might have made. The bars on McDougall Street were empty. There had been a fist fight. A man leaned against the lamppost as if crucified, the rain washing the blood off his face. In the dimly lit side street, where the sidewalk was like a ballroom mirror at closing time, a well-dressed man without shoes asked me for money. His eyes shone. He looked triumphant like a fencing master who had just struck a mortal blow. How strange it all was, the world's raffle, one dark October night. The yellowed volume of poetry with its splendors and glooms, which I studied by the light of storefronts, drugstores, and barber shops, afraid of my small windowless room, cold as a tomb of an infant emperor. That ending I would have never written if it wasn't, I wasn't, you know, by that time, totally under the spell of Shelley. Uh, I mean, you know, the infant emperor, come on, you know. Yeah. But uh, anyway, now I want to go someplace else slightly. I guess New Hampshire. A uh, different kind of poem. Uh, I suppose these poems are in some ways domestic. Something is going on. There are two, three people inside, men, women, and um, things go on between them, which are not fully apparent, but they are hinted at in the poems. Uh, this is called Against Whatever It Is That's Encroaching. Best of all is to be idle, and especially on a Thursday, 
and to sip wine while studying the light. The way it ages, yellows, turns ashen, and then hesitates forever on the threshold of the night that could be bringing the first frost. It's good to have a woman around just then, and two is even better. Let them whisper to each other and eye you with a smirk. Let them roll up their sleeves and unbutton their shirts a bit as this fine old twilight deserves. And the small schoolboy who has come home to a room almost dark and now watches wide-eyed the grown-ups raise their glasses to him, the giddy-headed, red-haired woman with eyes tightly shut as if she were about to cry or sing. This next poem is one of those poems where the title is sort of connected to the first line, you know, sort of go on quickly. And the title is Dear Helen. Dear Helen, there is a thing in the world called a sea cucumber. I know nothing about it. It just sounds cold and salty. I think a salad of such cukes would be fine today. I would have to die for it, though, deep into the treacherous depths, while you mince the garlic and sip the white wine into which the night is falling. I should be back soon with those lovely green vegetables out of the shark-infested sea. They're not vegetables. Some of you might know. Uh, animals, sea cucumbers are animals. Uh, but the speaker is not too reliable. It's not too swift. And that's part of the story. Uh, let's see. OK. This is called Cabbage. And uh, uh, a French utopian philosopher is mentioned here, a man by the name of Charles Fourier, who was lived in the 19th century and had all sorts of utopian notions about perfect societies. And uh, the, uh, there were many followers in this country of Charles Fourier who organized communes uh, in the Midwest in, uh, I guess, late 19th century, not so late, 70s, 1870s. Uh, and uh, on the model of Charles Fourier, kind of socialism, but very bizarre. I mean, it's a, it's a long story. Fourier is very strange. And uh, of course, they all collapsed. But uh, one time, I, I got really interested in Charles Fourier, and I wanted to read all his writings. And uh, there are very few things that are available in English. Uh, but looking at the catalog, I found that many of the translations uh, which I mean, have not been republished since, but exist in, in sort of uh, like Indianapolis newspapers in you know, 1870 and so forth, Midwestern newspapers, small newspapers that were, that were published. So Fourier was really big in the, in the Midwest. But anyway, something that Fourier said is, is mentioned in this poem. And, uh, it's a sort of a typical thing, the kind of things that Fourier would say. Uh, even, something even Robert Bly, I don't know if you know Robert Bly's poetry, I mean, be ashamed of saying, but uh, you'll see, you'll see. Uh, it's again like two people here, called Cabbage. She was about to chop the head in half, but I made her reconsider by telling her Cabbage symbolizes mysterious love, according to Charles Fourier, who said many other strange and wonderful things, so the people called him mad behind his back. Whereupon, I kissed the nape of her neck ever so gently, whereupon she cut the cabbage in two with a single stroke of the knife. Uh, 
Well, uh, I want to go to something a bit older here now. Uh, here's a poem. Um, uh, it's also a city poem in a way. Uh, it definitely is. Well, it doesn't have to be a city poem. Uh, you're just someplace uh, in, in a strange town, uh, and you're looking for a place to eat, and you go to some, you know, dive. There don't have to be choices. Maybe there are a couple of places, you know, one across the other on, this, on a particular block, and you, you go look, peek through this window, and you, ah, it doesn't look too good. There's nobody there. You cross the street. You know, you look there. It looks pretty bad, too. You know, back and forth, back and forth. Finally, you say, you know, the hell is it? Here, you know. And you go in there and you sit down and you realize you made a big mistake. You, know, just, you, just, you just know, you know. So anyway, here's a poem called A Partial Explanation. Not a full explanation, a partial explanation. Seems like a long time since the waiter took my order. Grimy little luncheonette. The snow falling outside. Seems like it has grown darker since I last heard the kitchen door behind my back, since I last noticed anyone pass on the street. A glass of ice water keeps me company at this table I chose myself upon entering. And a longing, incredible longing to eavesdrop on the conversation of cooks. This, there's a whole bunch of, this is from selected poems. I have a lot of short poems. Um, uh, here's a poem called Window Washer. And uh, it's a poem I have I published in many versions. Very short poem, but I could not get it right for a long time. Uh, this happens a great deal in the cities. I mean, especially if you live in New York and you walk walking down some skyscraper and you look up all of a sudden. Like, you don't look up too often, but there you see somebody there, you know, 50 floors up there, you know, on a scaffold, you know, washing windows or whatever. So I mean, that's the uh, that's the poem. Uh, and actually, there was there's really a, a day, there's a particular experience behind this. I mean, it's really one day being in, in, in downtown Manhattan, my God, it must be like in the early 60s. And, uh, and then I had you know, a couple of versions which were slightly different. And for some reason, the details are, were, were kind of eluding me. They were not correct or kept tinkering with the poem. The way the window washer, I suppose, you know, wash the windows. Window washer. And again, the screech of the scaffold high up there where all our thoughts converge, lightheaded, hung by a leather strap. 20 stories up in the chill of late November, wiping the grime off the pane, the many windows which have no way of opening tinted windows mirroring the clouds that are like equestrian statues, phantom liberators with sabers raised before these dark offices and their anonymous multitudes bent over this day's wondrously useless labor. There's a poem called Great Infirmities, uh, which came out of uh, a friend. I was living on the, on the West Coast and had moved to the West Coast, and people, my friends were calling me up at odd hours. You know, you know, beginning people don't know, you know. Uh, I mean, they just sort of have habits of calling at a certain time, and, you know. But, uh, uh, and, and somebody used the, the phrase, my, my great infirmities, which was sort of crazy. You know, pretentious phrase, you know, migrating, my infirmities, you know. There's a friend who always complained about everything in you know, his life. You know. 
was the most miserable life, the unhappiest life. You know. Life is only suffering, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, I heard that phrase, great infirmities, and then that kind of set off everything. I mean, just a poem took off from there. I, I had this vision of, of the East Coast where everybody was suffering from great infirmities. You know. <laughs> well, I was there, you know, in sunny California. You know. uh, so, great infirmities. Everyone has only one leg. So difficult to get around. So difficult to climb the stairs without a cane or a crutch to our name. And only one arm. Impossible contortions just to embrace the one you love. To cut the bread on the table. To put a coat on in a hurry. I should mention that we are almost blind and a little deaf in both ears perilous to be on the street among the congregations of the afflicted, with only a few steps committed to memory. Meekly, we let ourselves be diverted in the endless twilight, blind, seeing-eyed dogs on our leashes. An immense stillness everywhere, with the trees always bare, the raindrops coming down only halfway, coming so close and giving up. Okay, let's see. Here's a poem. I haven't read, I think, in years. Uh, I, I sort of was looking through poems this morning, and I said, this is interesting. Uh, the title is Notes Slipped Under a Door. And, uh, you know, in a country, you drive out to see somebody, and, and they're not home. <laughs> so you peek in. You bang, you can open the door because the doors are usually unlocked anyway. And, uh, but even still, you're kind of embarrassed. At least I'm embarrassed to go in. So I wrote a note, and I, I, write, I wrote a note and I slipped under the door. That's all it is. Note slipped under the door. I saw a high window struck blind by the late afternoon sunlight. I saw a towel with many dark fingerprints hanging in the kitchen. I saw an old apple tree, a shawl of wind over its shoulders, inch its lonely way toward the barren hills. I saw an unmade bed and felt the cold of its sheets. I saw a fly soaked in pitch of the coming night, watching me because it couldn't get out. I saw stones that had come from a great purple distance huddle around the front door. Another country poem in, in a very kind of abstract language, um, slightly pretentious. Um, it's called Elegy. The reason the language is as it is, uh, the speaker is more than little drunk. Uh, what had happened is that two people have uh, are, were eating outside. They're eating. It's late summer. They, they have brought a table out there, and they're in a, some distance from the house. And uh, they're sitting there, and they're eating, and they kind of got pissed off at each other. It's not quite. I'm not telling you the whole story. It's not quite clear. But there's something going on. They're drinking, you know, and it gets dark, and it's kind of a, a too drunk. Or grumpy to get up and go to the house, turn on some kind of a light, and pretty soon it's like <laughs> pitch dark, you know, cold, late August, it gets cold in, in New Hampshire. So anyway, that, that sort of thing. I even mentioned some of these details in the poem. So uh, 
The speaker at this point can't see anything. He's in pitch dark. That's all he, he speaks. Allergy. Note as it gets darker that little can be ascertained of the particulars and of their true magnitudes. Note the increasing unreliability of vision, though one thing may appear more or less familiar than another, disengaged from reference as they are in the deepening gloom. Nothing to do but sit and abide, depending on memory to provide the vague outline, the theory of where we are tonight and why we can see so little of each other and soon will be even less able. In this starless summer night, windy and cold, at a table brought out hours ago under a huge ash tree, two chairs, two ambiguous figures, each one relying on the other to remain faithful now that one can leave without the other one knowing. This late, in what only recently was a garden, a festive occasion elaborately planned for two lovers in the open air at the end of a dead end road, rarely traveled, all oh, love. Let's see, a few more poems. Uh, There's a poem called Bedtime Story. Uh, I have few poems, more than few, actually, but uh, poems in which some philosophical cliche is used, uh, some question, one of those, some timeless question of philosophy is employed as a kind of an opening. And then I, I proceed to solve the great paradox or in some kind of a, what shall I say? I was gonna say logical fashion, but that wouldn't be it, poetic logical metaphor. Um, uh, you'll see what I mean. I don't know. I don't know exactly what, what, what how I go about it, but um, anyway, the poem, uh, Bedtime Story. And you'll recognize the cliche immediately as I begin reading the poem. It's a short poem. It's only eight lines. Uh, bedtime Story. When a tree falls in a forest, and there is no one around to hear the sound. The poor owls have to do all the thinking. They think so hard, they fall off their perch and are eaten by ants, who, as you already know, all look like little black riding hoods. It's a poem by Crows. Crows. Just so that each stark spiked twig may be even more fierce with significance, there are these birds as further harbingers of the coming wintry reduction to sign an enigma. The absolutely necessary way in which they shook snow out of their wings and then remained inexplicably thus, wings half open, making two large algebraic X's as if for emphasis or in the, or in the mockery of. OK. 
her. Uh, two more poems. This one called The Great Horn Owl. And uh, as I've been living in, a, in a, sort of in the woods in the country since 1973, but I don't see anything. I mean, I realized when my, after my kids have sort of have grown up, you know, they, if we take a walk through the woods, they always are pointing things to me, you know, look, look, you know. I, when I'm in a city, I merely notice everything. I mean, I just, you know, I look at faces, I, I, I think I can imagine their life story. Uh, and uh, I mean, it's like in the city, I'm just completely sort of, I understand everything that goes on, all the signs. And so one morning, my son, who was then quite little, pointed out this great horned owl. Uh, and those owls are really much bigger than one would expect them to be. I mean, they're really huge. I mean, they're sort of like turkeys, I don't know. Uh, sort of absurdly big, you know. It's one of those things you say, can't possibly fly, you know. Uh, too big, kind of stupid, absurd, you know, like a joke, you know. You know, so to insult you, you know, look at me, you know, so big, you know, silly. So uh, I'm talking to the, uh, I'm talking about the owl, great horn owl. One morning, the grand seigneur is so good as to appear. He sits in a scrawny little tree in my backyard. When I say his name aloud, he turns his head and looks at me in utter disbelief. I show him my belt, how I had to tighten it lately to the final hole. He ruffles his feathers, studies the empty woodshed, the old red Chevy on blocks. Alas, he's got to be going. Uh, well, final poem, uh, another one of these 50s poems. This is, I'm still in Chicago in this poem. I still haven't gotten to New York. And the poem is called The Immortal. You are shivering my memory. You went out early and coatless to visit your old schoolmasters, the cruel schoolmasters and their pet monkeys. You took a wrong turn somewhere. You met an army of gray days, a ghost army of years on the march. It must have been the bread they fed you, the ditch water they made you drink. You found yourself again on that street, inside that narrow room with a single dusty window. Outside it was snowing, as in a dream. You were ill and in bed. The whole world was absent at work. The blind old woman next door whose sighs and shuffling you'd welcome had died mysteriously in the summer. You had your own breath to listen to. You were perfectly alone and anonymous. It would have taken months for anyone to begin to miss you. The chill made you pull the covers up to your chin. You remember the lost Arctic voyagers, the evening snow erasing their footprints. You had no money and no prospects in sight. Both of your lungs were hurting. You had no intention of lifting a finger to help yourself. You were immortal. Outside, the same dark snowflake seemed to be falling over and over again. You studied the cracked walls, the map-like water stain on the ceiling, trying to fix in your mind each detail. Time had stopped at dusk. You were shivering at the thought of such great happiness. Thank you.
Excellent. Good job.